Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Nearly 2,500 years ago, the Greek physician Hippocrates had it right. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. But in the years since, we seem to have lost sight of that important principle. Well, my guest today says there's a lot we can learn from the ancients, including how to battle depression, reduce pain, and heal our symptoms at the root, all without dangerous pharmaceuticals. Dr. Axe is a doctor of chiropractic, a certified doctor of natural medicine, and clinical nutritionist practicing in Nashville. And he's just released a brand new book called Ancient Remedies. So on today's episode, Dr. Axe and I are going to discuss what Western medicine has gotten all wrong, the most effective natural ways to boost your immune system, pretty important right now, and the best thing you can do today to start improving your health. Dr. Axe, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Hey, Dr. Gundry, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So you write in the first section of your book that Western medicine has largely ignored, put down, even buried information about safe, natural alternatives to pharmaceutical drugs. Can you give the listeners a few examples of what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I want to mention this too, you know, I realized this very early on. I had a mom growing up that was sick all the time. My mom was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, later on, hypothyroidism, autoimmune disease. She was on antidepressant drugs. So very sick all the time. And I really started saying, okay, my mom just keeps getting getting worse and getting prescribed more and more things. You know, later on, as I started studying all these forms of natural medicine, I started realizing, okay, there, there are things that can, that can actually address more of the root cause here of what's going on. And so, you know, I'll give you an example, you know, and, and I'll say this for, I just want to say this for the medical community. There's no doubt in the past 15 years, there has been a big shift, right? I mean, 15 years ago, we weren't hearing uh, a lot of, you know, the, the pioneering medical doctors talking about herbs and spices today, many are. So I think we have come a long way. So I wanted to say that first, but you know, just to give an example, an, an herb like turmeric has so much clinical research. It's been shown to be effective in a lot of human trials as well at reducing inflammation, specifically eff effective at fighting chronic pain, lowering the risk of heart disease, supporting blood sugar balance. There's even uh, some research uh, on a compound in it called curcumin, which is the main anti-inflammatory compound I know you know, but in fighting cancer. So there are a lot of benefits when we're talking about ancient remedies. And what's interesting too, Doc, is if you would have gone, let's say, 100, up, up until 150 years ago, so throughout human history, when somebody used the word medicine up until 150 years ago, they were typically referring to an herb or a spice. If you went into, they called it an apothecary, which is essentially yep. an ancient pharmacy. But if you would go to that in Asia or the Middle East or East or in Rome, it, you know, you'd go in there and they would have herbs and spices and oils and probably glandulars and mushrooms like that. That's what people were taking. And a lot of drugs today, like aspirin, for an example, that main compound in aspirin that has the pain relieving benefits and blood thinning benefits Actually, they got the idea for that from a compound found in white willow bark and wintergreen, and so which then they now make synthetically today. But I think the thing about a lot of these natural forms of medicine also, they're, they're a little bit more gentle on the body. Um, and I think in many cases, they're just as effective. And I think in most cases, too, they address more of the root of what's going on. No, I think that's a an absolute great observation. And it's, it's kind of, I've actually got some wonderful old apothecary jars in my office. Uh, I love that. And yeah, that's, uh, everybody was given, you know, herbs and spices. And in fact, I think we forget um, that the spice trade, you, uh, the only reason people would risk their lives uh, in procuring things like, say, cinnamon or black pepper, and you know, 50% of people died on ocean voyages during the spice trade. And the only reason anybody ever risks their lives, or the second reason is the only reason people spend a whole lot of money for something is because it's a drug. And you know, we forget that these were all the original great drugs. And uh, yeah, so the drug trade has been around for a long time, but it was a natural drug trade. How's that? That's right, exactly. Okay, so you use a great example that I firmly believe in, antidepressants. 
Why did you single out uh, these drugs and what are some ancient uh, alternatives proven to work? One of the big things, Dr. Gundry, Gundry, I always try and do, and I, and I know you do the same. That's why, again, I'm a huge fan of your podcast, your books. I know, obviously, you came on my podcast, and we talked about this, but we always want to address the root cause of disease. And so when we're talking about any disease, in particular, in this case, depression, we, we, an ancient physician, that's really what I always focus on is, hey, w what are the you know ancient Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, what would have Hippocrates have done, and how should we act today in getting the root cause of disease? Well, in particular with depression, what is known about that in ancient Chinese medicine is it, it is caused by, primarily, it's not a nutritional deficiency. Now, nutritional supplements can help, absolutely, but primarily, it's b b caused by uh, having something happen to you in the past that you're still living with today. So, for example, it could be you lost a loved one you really cared about, and you're still living with that grief. It could be you went through a, a divorce, and you, you still have pain from that relationship. It could be you were abused emotionally, physically, um, and you're still living with that trauma. Or it could be unforgiveness. You have something that hurt you in the past— and you have not let go of that thing. That's the term they use in Chinese medicine is that you haven't let go. And so according to Chinese medicine, that is the biggest thing that weakens your lungs and your colon, which is the main, what makes up the main part in Chinese medicine of your immune system. So, so the, what an ancient physician would recommend is, okay, the first thing we need to do is, hey, we need to let go of that thing. We need to practice forgiveness. We need to focus on stop focusing on the past and start focusing on the now and the future. We need to build hope. Let's get you excited about things. Let's find your purpose. That's really where it starts. And then from there, your body needs certain nutrients and, um, uh, and compounds to support having healthy tissue. So for instance, if you don't have enough protein and you're lifting weights all the time, it's, it's easier to injure a muscle because your body doesn't have what it needs to rebuild itself. Think about our brain and nervous system in the same way. There's two big things I want to say that a lot of the micronutrients, uh, or, or let's say herbals, for instance, herbals more than anything, put your body in a, they change your environment. So they get your body in a healthy environment to where it can better heal itself. Um, what macronutrients do, uh, proteins, fats, those sort of things, they give your body those building blocks it needs to repair itself in a lot of cases, and nutrients would be the same. So I think some of the most beneficial for depression, there are studies on, well, let me go back to this, yoga as well for peace of mind. That goes along with a lot of the emotional techniques I talked about with letting go of the past. I think that's very, very healthy mindset. Deep breathing is very good in that way as well. There are studies though that show certain herbs, particularly the ones that increase blood flow through the brain and ones that support, you know, uh, neurotransmitters help as well. So St. John's were historically probably has the most research on it. Um, yep. I think that can be a good one. I think, uh, ginkgo biloba, generally speaking, it's typically more for Alzheimer's, but it gets a lot of blood flow to the brain. So that's typically prescribed in Chinese medicine. I think that's a good one. Um, and then also things like CBD oil and then fish oil, you know, getting those omega threes. But I think from a dietary standpoint, you want to get a lot of fat soluble nutrients and the right type of fats, three type of fats. I'd recommend lots of omega threes, wild caught fish like salmon is a great example. Walnuts is another good example. Um, also getting healthy saturated fats from animal products and from places like coconut oil and then healthy monounsaturated fats from olives, avocados, you know, uh, you know, um, those sort of things. I think those are great examples. So, so I would say, you know, eat a diet that's really rich in fat, really rich in nutrients that support the brain. A lot of those B vitamins supporting those neurotransmitters, some probiotics really supporting that gut lining. So collagen or bone broth as a food would be good. And then really practicing things like meditation and yoga and letting go of the past and building on a hopeful future. So that's, you know, I think when we're talking about holistic medicine and looking at the person as a whole, I know I said a lot of things, but I think, uh, but, but you know, I mean, you see this doc, right? It's di everybody is uniquely different. For some people, it really is an emotional, that's the biggest stronghold. But for some people, wow, it's amazing. They start taking omega-3 fats and other things and boom, it's, you know, you see a big change. No, it's very true. And I think one thing in that long list, which I completely agree with, uh, the gut microbiome we're now beginning to realize has such a uh, important role in anxiety and depression and just changing the gut microbiome and actually the postbiotics that they manufacture 
uh, goes a long way. A couple now new clinical trials looking at this, and Dr. Daniel Amen, who I've had on the progress podcast, you know, really thinks that most of what we call you know anxiety and depression or mental illness, a lot of it is stemming you know from our gut uh, and gut dysbiosis and leaky gut. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that as well. In fact, if we're talking Chinese medicine, there's two systems, but basically it's that intestinal wall um, that really is going to affect the gut lining. And really, there's two big things I think people can do. And, and I, I, touch, I touch on this in my book, Ancient Remedies, some I really go into how to get to the root cause and heal conditions like leaky gut. The big thing, though, I will say is here's essentially what happens. Your gut lining acts like a net, right? So everybody think about a fishing net. Well, your gut lining is supposed to let certain things through and keep other things out. Well, you have these things, they're called gap junctions, but let's just go back to this net analogy. Imagine you get a tear in this net and all of a sudden things that are getting into your bloodstream are getting in there that shouldn't be getting in there. So undige fully undigested food particles like certain proteins like gluten and casein are very problematic. Certain types of bad bacteria, even parasites, viruses, these things get into the bloodstream, they recirculate and they cause an inflammatory reaction. And over time, it can actually cause an immune reaction, even leading to autoimmune disease. But, you know, Dr. Gundry, one of the, when I first moved to Nashville and when I opened up the practice I had here, I took care of a lot of children on the ASD, uh, autistic spectrum disorders. And I'll just tell you, it was amazing. I really focused on just supporting their gut health, getting rid of the gluten and casein, getting some probiotics, some bone broth, some easily digestible, you know, vegetables and meat. But I mean, the, the results were so just so incredible. And so all that being said, when people do have any sort of issue that's neurologically related, the first thing I typically do is say, OK, we, we've got to reheal and seal that gut lining and it's get rid of those. So many things I know you hit on in your book, The Plant Paradox. We've got to get rid of these inflammatory foods. We've got to add in the really that the big thing is the easily to, di to digest, because what's just what's more important, I think, than the food you're eating is not continually harming your own body, you know, giving your body a chance to regenerate. And that's why the best food for the body is typically the one that's the easiest on the body. And that typically is a diet that's made up of meat, certain vegetables that are cooked and fat, you know, it's like the eat. So, so anyways, I think those are all, but I, I agree with you. I think the gut microbiome is so key to healing a lot of areas, the brain, the skin, um, even, you know, a, a lot of immune conditions. Yeah. Um, how do you, in this environment, obviously physicians are coming around to the idea that there is such a thing as leaky gut. Now, you, if, you had, if you had asked me 20 years ago when I started this practice of mine, what I thought about leaky gut, I probably would have laughed you out of the room as, as pseudoscience. Uh, but now, um, you know, thanks to Dr. Fasano and others, this is a real thing. It's a proven thing. There's no question, hopefully in anyone's mind. How do you convince a typical patient that, uh, for instance, Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine has scientific proof that they're looking for that it works? Well, I think one of the important things that people need to remember is, is that I think there is a, and I don't want to be, uh, you know, um, let, let me, I think there's a level of ego that we have in America. Like we're the best, we know more than anybody else, other people like, so, so, so there is that ego, I think that really, uh, creates a lack of humility and a lack of learning with, with people. And so I, I think it's impo important. Number one, if you're going to grow, you got to realize you don't know it all and realize that some of these things that have been proven throughout history, that they're, they're still around for a reason. And so I think there's different ways to discover things. I think today we live in a Western society. It's very Greek and in, in, Greek in nature, which means we like to have a reason for everything. And we like to, uh, you know, we, we like to, um, come to conclusions uh, based on numbers, okay? A specific number, it's, it's the way we are today. Uh, double blind studies is a prime example of this. In order for it to be credible, it has to be a human double blind study in this. But the thing, the problem that we have today too is that not all of these studies are 
in fact, I would say a lot of studies can be biased in nature. I think it's an important thing to remember. The thing I'll say about, I think it, for me, Chinese medicine has been around for around 3,000 years. And it's been proven in a way by, I would say, millions of individual case studies. So it's not a double blind study, but it's individual case studies of saying, like, like how did the Indians know that if there was a snake bite, you should use blessed thistle or milk thistle or the d- different types of thistles? How did they know that thistles helped poison? Like, like you know, h- how did they know? Like, I, I, this is so funny. Ten years ago, well, it was probably about nine years ago, the study came out on one of the big ones on piperine and turmeric, that combination of those two herbs together. And we were applauding ourselves, saying, like the medical community is saying, wow, look at this. The one study was it improves absorption by 154%. That's significant. Wow, you're taking turmeric, you're taking it with this compound, this one unique compound in black pepper. The recipe for turmeric golden milk, which is nearly 3,000 years old in Ayurvedic medicine, the recipe is turmeric plus a warming spice blend called Trichitu, which is made up of black pepper, long pepper ginger, and healthy fat like ghee or coconut. And you drink this mixture for brain health, cellular health, and the big one is reducing inflammation, helping treat certain conditions. Chinese medicine Ayurvedic knew that black pepper and turmeric were better together for absorption 3,000 years ago. So all that being said, and they did it by observation, doing it on themselves, working with patients, individual case studies. So I would just say, you know, I, I, I think, I think in terms of seeing results, it can be very, very effective. But, but for me, doc, it's always through education. I think really, you know, simplistic education and going through whether it's the leaky gut analogy with the net, that type of thing, explaining it. But, but, you know, I think that when you look at certain areas of the world today, Israeli medicine, for one, and a lot of the medicine that is uh, in the research done in areas like Japan and Switzerland and Germany, I mean, it's not just America. I mean, they're anyways. So I, I, that, that, may, that may answer that, you know, that's a roundabout way of that answer. But I do think for me, like, I really think that traditional Chinese medicine is actually more accurate today than Western medicine in the viewpoint, because it has a bigger picture perspective. Really what has happened a lot of times today in our medical community, conventional, is we've we've looked at things under a microscope, but we haven't stepped back and looked at the big picture of all these things, how they're interconnected, some of the the um the patterns that repeat themselves. So that's that's my thought. Good point. Um you know I'm reminded of uh and I've written about this in a lot of my books, including the upcoming energy paradox, that you know Hippocrates used to teach that there was this green life force energy in in all all of us that really was in control of our perfect health. And Helen of Bindon was a huge promoter in the Middle Ages of this idea that you were supposed to find the external forces that were were suppressing your green life force energy and remove them. And that, the patient, don't worry, once you remove these external forces, this green life force energy will will solve all the problems. And as as crazy as that sounds, that's actually how I I do my practice. I'm just a detective. And, you know, okay, let's see what's suppressing your healing ability. And, you know, you do the exact same thing. Well, you know, what's interesting in Chinese medicine, they have the same, same thing. They call them the six evils. Um, but that's, it's, it's really the same thing. Because, you know, Greek medicine had the humors, right? The sim- it's, right. Uh, it's very similar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Speaking of uh, immune system and COVID-19. Um, I've been preaching since it came out that the reason pre-existing conditions set you up for COVID-19 is because all of these pre-existing conditions, in my humble opinion, is just a manifestation of leaky gut in one way or another. Yep. And your immune system is hyper on alert and this cytokine storm is because your immune system is overcharged and it's distracted in a way because of what what things are happening in your gut so what's your what's your feeling how can anything we can do to um, help ourselves 
Yeah. So what I tend to recommend, and I know that, uh, and what's interesting, Doc, is probably this was in March, right when COVID sort of hit the scene. I had, uh, I went on an interview and shared my thoughts on certain nutrients like vitamin D and zinc. And I said, everybody should start taking these now. It was crazy. I got all of these criticisms from certain people saying, how can you say vitamins and minerals are effective against this? There's no research on that. I'm like, Hey, I'm going off 3000 years of Chinese medicine and what they're saying, which is just strengthen your immune system. Here's the thing to understand. Like your body heals itself. If you get a cut on your hand here, this force that Dr. Gundry you're talking about, it's that that heals you. Broccoli doesn't heal you. Turmeric doesn't heal you. Your body heals itself. Now, herbs and spices, they can support and get your body in a better environment. Like you put lavender oil on there or something, you have a lesser chance of it getting infected. Okay. So you're protecting it, but those things don't heal you, but they can be building blocks to help your body heal and they can support the environment of, of that healing. So all that being said, I really think that number one thing we have to do is, uh, you know, eliminate stress and high cortisol, you know? So I think that really, uh, focusing on watching the news less. I don't know anybody who watched <laughs> the news and was like, you know what? I'm less stressed now. I feel really hopeful. <laughs> I feel really hopeful and good. I mean, there, there are a lot of studies that show how stress creates inflammation within our body. In fact, doc, you've seen the same thing. When I had my practice, if I had a patient come in with inflammatory bowel disease and they ate certain types of gluten or casein or wheat and dairy, major flare up, you know, I mean, just can be crippling, but what, it, what would affect them just as much as if they had a really, uh, like, like a lot of stress in their family or whatever, they would have the same reaction. So all that being said, one faith over fear, really focus on, you know, uh, hope getting yourself in a joyful state. I think that is really huge part of healing. Number two is the foods that really are most supportive in Chinese medicine for building and strengthening your immune system. Cause that's what we know, doc, right? It's like, okay, who's most at risk? people with pre-existing conditions and immunodeficiency, okay? There's this, we gotta bring up and strengthen the immune system, reduce the inflammation. So a diet that's really rich in wild organic meat, cooked vegetables, certain fruits, and some healthy fats, and that's generally speaking the diet. In Chinese medicine, they would recommend a lot of light yellow foods. They would say those are the most beneficial for the lungs and colon or your immune system, generally speaking. Uh, and so that's going to be things like ginger, which is light yellow. It's going to be chicken broth. When you're sick, no one says drink beef broth. Why is it chicken? Well, chicken broth contains not only collagen, but glucosamine, chondroitin, and hyaluronic acid, which are great for the gut lining, really reparative and restorative. So that's good. Um, garlic and onions are, are known to support it for some people don't do as well. Some people can. Onions in particular are, are known to you know, support cellular health and mitochondria. So some of those foods are good. Uh, and then some of those orange foods, you know, um, a little sweet potato and pumpkin and squash, things like that. Um, that's better for upper GI issues. Uh, but generally speaking, again, meat, vegetable, you know, cooked vegetables and fruit, like in Chinese medicine, they would say drink, like when I was sick as a kid and I'm curious, Dr. Steven, if you had the same thing, my mom always gave me the same thing when I was sick chicken soup and ginger ale. And if we, they were at a ginger ale, she gave me seven up. Cause I guess that's the same thing for, to her. So, but that the ancient remedy for a cold and flu in Chinese medicine, that's been prescribed for 3000 years is chicken soup and ginger herbal tea. Okay. So it's chicken bone broth, lots of veggies and just drinking ginger herbal tea. Very good for you. In fact, it's like, why do we call it a cold today? Well, according to Chinese medicine, one of those six evils is your body is cold internally. So most of the remedies for fighting a cold are warming herbs and spices like oregano and garlic and cinnamon and all these things that are. So not to get too off topic, let me finish up here. So the other things, <laughs> I, yeah. So, so so the other things I'd recommend here, I, I I really think vitamin D is probably the most important, and zinc. I really think those are the two nutrients that our body needs the most and we tend to be most efficient in, especially when I used to do blood work in my office, so many people deficient in vitamin D. And athletes, zinc is the biggest thing they're deficient in because zinc is responsible for tissue repair. So if you have these crossfitters and marathoners, they absolutely need to have that. And then vitamin C, vitamin A, selenium, those can be important, but vitamin D, zinc, most important. And then from an herbal standpoint, it depends on where you have the issue. If you really need to support respiratory health and lungs, 
cordycep mushrooms tend to be the one that's most prescribed in Chinese medicine or ginseng, uh, ginseng for the full body. And sometimes something like echinacea, uh, would be, and then if it's more long-term, just supporting long-term immune health, ginger and astragalus are two of the best. Astragalus was probably one of the top three herbs recommended for leaky gut in Chinese medicine. So those would be some of my, my favorites. All right. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny. There are now, uh, I think at last count last week, 17 separate studies, uh, confirming the benefit of high levels of vitamin D in preventing getting COVID, or if you get COVID, lessening its effect. And I've seen this uh, recently, I, I may have mentioned it on another podcast, but I have a, a number of elderly patients and often the wife sees me and the husband poo poos it as just, <laughs> you know, pseudoscience. And I've, I've been running my patients vitamin D's above 100 nanograms uh, per deciliter for as long as I can remember. And so just recently, uh, some elderly patients in March of last year came down with COVID. Uh, the wife who was following me, she said, ah, I, was, I had a cold for 48 hours, it was nothing. My husband spent 56 days in the ICU on a ventilator, almost turned him off spent five and a half months in the hospital and just now, you know, got out. And the other one, a uh, Hispanic couple, she followed me. He didn't. She, nothing happened to her, even though she caught it. And her husband is dead. And yeah. it's just like, come on, folks. And, and there's actually a move to make the World Health Organization basically mandate getting vitamin D to everybody. Um, I have never in, in 20 years seen vitamin D toxicity. I, I do not think it exists. Yep. Uh, Dr. Mark Hyman has never seen it in his practice. But for goodness sakes, uh, let's get some vitamin D in folks. And Zinc, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, we should also do a whole show on why, you know, women listen and have all this wisdom and men just never seem to get the point. Because my mom and dad are the same way. My mom is so into natural health, taking care of herself. My dad does it because my mom forces him to. But my dad's like an old military guy. Like I tried to bring him out for sushi once and he's like, you know, I won't touch that thing anyways. It's yeah. You know, you bring up a good point. So what do you do? Um what do you do when you know or somebody comes to you and they're a family member? who's in trouble, um, they've got you know, a major health issue or crisis. Any tricks to how do you get that person to, to try it, to listen? Uh, it's, it's a tough sell. It is, you know, I think for most people what I found, and I'll just share this with my own family and for myself, you know, I think it really comes down to uh, what your priorities are, what's important to you. And so I can share this for, for my dad, what really allows me to connect with my dad and get him to change some of his lifestyle things, my dad is a semi-pro water skier, he's seven years old, but he's been water skiing his whole life, and he, he actually likes working out, but his joints are just very, very sore all the time. And so if I can help him educate himself and say, hey dad, read this article on turmeric, read this article on proteolytic enzymes, or things like bromelain and pineapple, or and, and so I have him, so, really encouraging people to educate themselves, put in that situation. I try not say you should just take this. I mean, some people do well with that. Again, my mom does, but my dad doesn't work that way. So I think sort of, and the other thing is, you know, we've all heard this quote, but people don't uh, care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so like I've had times, I'm just with my dad where I'll just set him down and just say, dad, listen, I, I want to let you know, like, I love you more than anything. And my, um, like, I want you running around with our daughter Arwen and bringing her to Disney World. And I, and I, I just want to see you, you know, my, my, my dad and I go to college football games sometimes. And so, you know, I, I'll just share with him like, dad, I, I want to be doing this when you're 90. Hey, can you do this for me? I just want you to, hey, just start doing this smoothie or taking this. So I think connecting on the heart level and finding out what is that thing they want and finding and, and really helping uh, educate them on how taking this or doing this will help them achieve what they're looking to achieve. So that's, a, that's actually a good segue. I know you're not afraid to talk about things like spirituality, prayer, sure. meditation, yep. other practices that Western medicine eh, typically dismisses. 
So um, how do you bring that into your practice, introduce it to a patient who may think that this is uh, silly stuff? Well, one thing I'm always very respectful of in, in, in letting people know, hey, listen, I'm here for you. I'm here to serve you and help you reach your health goals. And so I'll ask permission and say, hey, I, I think it would be really good if we talked about your emotional health or, or hey, where you're at spiritually. I mean, typically it's more your emotional health. And I, I get their permission first. And if they say, yeah, I am interested in doing everything I can to get healthy, including looking at my emotions. Okay, hey, let's talk about that then. And then I'll dive in. So that's the first thing I do is, again, ask their permission. In terms of how I lead it down with them, and again, I don't think, you know, I think one of the things is n not a lot of people are, uh, physicians are trained in this. Obviously, if somebody is trained in, as a psychologist, you know, psychiatrist or psychologist or some of those, uh, you know, I think there's a great, there's obviously a much greater degree of training there uh, or a counselor. But for me, it's something that I have trained, you know, to a degree self-trained on um, really looking at, again, these ancient forms of medicine and which emotions affect which organ systems. And so I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll explain it to them and recommend certain practices. All right. So what was the most surprising or interesting thing you learned while researching the new book? Oh, goodness. You know, I think yeah. one of the things I think that is so interesting is um, is how these ancient forms of medicine, just the uh, how they know, like, for instance, how did they know that andrographis is good for this condition, reishi mushroom for this, tumor for this, all the different things? They know it based on typically three things. What it looks like, the taste, and the color, Okay. And sometimes where it grows, that sort of thing. But that, those are the three big things. So, for instance, when somebody looks at, a, in Chinese medicine, a walnut, they would say, well, walnut's good for the brain. Why is a walnut good for the brain? Well, one, it's that color. It's a certain brown color. It's actually almost the color of brain tissue. I mean, if you look at a brain and that, it's brain is a little more pink. But that being said, there's a white component. But, but it, when you crack it open, it actually looks like two hemispheres of your brain. That's the other thing. Is there a creator? Are you telling me there's just a walnut that literally looks like a brain and it's one of the best foods for the brain? It's high in choline, omega-3 fats, uh, you know, um, vitamin E. So all those great things for the brain. And, and like celery looks like your bones. Celery is high in vitamin K and, and calcium. More than that, though, it's one of the most alkaline vegetables. So it actually prevents your body losing minerals, alkaline minerals. Beets look like your blood. They boost nitric oxide, so they're great for your heart. Reishi mushroom. If you look up a reishi, it looks identical to your kidneys. They're known as an adrenal tonic, which sits on your kidneys. You know, so, um, and I could go on. There's so many. Tomatoes have four chambers. Your heart has four chambers. Lycopene has been shown to help combat heart disease. Avocados look like a uterus. The magnesium, the potassium, the monounsaturated fats, great for the uterus. Figs look like testes. They were, they were prized in Roman culture and even today have been shown to help your libido. So all that being said, I thought it was so fascinating when you look at ancient uh, Asian herbalism and medicine that they prescribed foods. They would say, hey, you've got this condition. Here's your food prescription. Like uh, immune health I talked about. You got to do a lot of chicken soup and ginger. Oh, you've got adrenal and thyroid issues. That type of hormonal uh, is down. We're going to prescribe adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha and rhodiola and ginseng and have you do a lot of berries and, um, and seafood like wild fish and seaweed. Like that'd be the prescription there. So I just think the food is medicine prescriptions and then different flavors affect different organ systems. Sour affects your liver and really supports your detoxification channels. Um, bitter, it really affects your heart and helps dry up candida and dampness. Um, uh, sweet affects the pancreas, the upper GI. Um, bitter affects, or I'm sorry, uh, and then there's one more. Salty affects the, Salt. ki the kidneys. And then umami. Yeah, umami is the uh, lungs and colon, your immune system. It affects that. And then different colors. So green is the liver anyway. So, but in the book, I get into all of that. So if somebody's struggling with hypothyroidism. In the book, I really go through, here are the exact foods, the exact supplements that help treat the root cause of that disease, reverse that condition. I actually do that for over 70 conditions in the book. But I think that was the most fascinating is like, you know, how these different herbs act in foods as medicine for specific conditions. All right. So, you know, it was great having you on the podcast. Uh, as if anyone really needed to know, where can they find you? Where can you find your book? What's your website, etc.? 
Yeah, so everybody can find me on DrAxe.com, also on social media, at Dr. Josh Axe on Instagram and Facebook. And then, yeah, they can uh, find the new book if they want to dig in and learn more. We've got a lot, ton of healthy recipes in there, eating plans are in there. And, if, and again, if anybody's struggling with any condition, whether it be diabetes, infertility, um, low testosterone, they can get it there or prescription. It actually acts as a reference guide as well. So you can read the book, but then go in the back and continue to look up hey, I've got this condition or this issue. It has a prescription in there for it. And um, anyways, and just, yeah, I encourage everybody to just search Dr. Josh Axe Ancient Remedies on Amazon.com. Uh, and, 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 and hey, check out the book. I think you'll love it. And Dr. Gondry, I just want to say too, I'm just so honored to be on your podcast. You know, I love your books. Obviously, you know, your books have sold like crazy. I'm sure everybody here is listening has read it. But uh, anyways, I just love what a pioneer you've been in really teaching people how to reduce inflammation. And uh, thanks for having me on. Well, I appreciate it. And anyone who's listening, I actually get uh, Dr. X's email. I subscribed to him, oh, before anybody knew about him, probably. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I greatly appreciate the information that you've provided through the years. Um, good for you. All right, so as you know, uh, we do an audience question, and uh, we're both going to have a crack at this. All right. Because I think uh, we, this is kind of something that we've been talking about. So this one is from Sarah Liz 1127 on Instagram. Diet and supplements to help with melasma. Now, uh, yeah, I think this will be great. You want to just quick tell people what melasma is, and then what do you think from your principles. Got any, any thoughts for this? Yeah. So melasma, that's what you, you start to, it's essentially a, um, a hyperpigmentation. People start yep. to get, you know, dark spots, uh, you know, on their skin and, and listen, some is normal with aging, but this is just, it's much more severe in Chinese medicine. It's really an issue with, um, a, a lot with something called, uh, yin and yang. Okay. Now that when I first heard that term yin and yang, I thought, well, that's, you know, seems kind of crazy now. It's just really a different language. Um, so anytime you have a skin issue like this in Chinese medicine, it tends to be related to your digestive system. And there being a imbalance in your digestive system, typically your body can be too yin or yang. And so in Chinese medicine, they would recommend an, typically a form of an adaptogen that's good for the digestive system. So probably probably the number one herb for this specific condition in Chinese medicine would be licorice root. That would be very, very high up on the list. It's mildly anti-inflammatory, but it's also good at, at calming things, balancing the body. It's, it's good at calming and coating that gut lining. So, so that would probably be the first herb recommended. Um, let me think of some of the others. I would also say astragalus would probably be on that list as well. I'd say licorice and astragalus uh, would be the first two herbs I would recommend. And again, I would just always go to um, also looking at what's happened in the past. Is there been, you know, is there an emotional trauma really focusing on healing that? And then I would do a diet that's really rich in those yellow foods, foods that are good for the immune system, um, in particular in the stomach. And so yellow foods, orange foods, and, uh, that's, that would be, that would be what I'd prescribe. All right. So uh, I, see, um, I see this actually quite a bit in uh, a number of my uh, black female patients who frequently have this uh, on their neck, their upper shoulders, um, back sometimes. And I can tell you that I've yet to see any of these patients who don't have an elevated insulin level. Mm. And I've, I've said in the past, if I was going to have one blood test and one blood test only, to tell someone their fate, it would be a fasting insulin level. If I if I only got one, wow. Um, and so I'm I'm speaking of supplements. I would number one, I'd certainly give them my my diet. But uh, cinnamon is very useful. Selenium is very useful. Berberine is probably mm. way up on my list of of supplements. Uh, which is Oregon grape root, um, for those of you who want to know where it came from originally. Uh, so, uh, great answers. And, uh, but this is, this is a really fixable, resolvable condition, as are most things. And, you know, and that, that brings me to, you know, thank every one of you for 
sending in these emails. And if you haven't already, you can sign up for the Dr. Gundry podcast newsletter by going to drgundry.com and entering your email on the home page. You'll get announcements about every new episode, like Dr. Axe, and find out about upcoming news and events. Again, go to drgundry.com and sign up. All right, Josh, pleasure uh, seeing you again. Keep up the good work, and I'll look forward to your e emails. And, and do get the book. It's, uh, you know, these ancient wisdoms are ancient, and they've been around a long time because there's actually true science behind all of this. It's, it's not voodoo, it's not pseudoscience. So, all right, good luck, good luck with the book. Thanks for having Take me, care. Doc. All right, now it's time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from Melissa Arnutovic, I probably slaughtered that, but I apologize, on YouTube, who had, said, had this to say about my re recent lecture on reading food labels. Thank you, Dr. Gundry, for another insightful episode. Big emphasis on the phrase, food with no nutrition label is the healthiest, AKA whole foods. Absolutely agree, and it has been a game changer. Thank you for bringing more clarity and empowering us to make more conscious decisions when it comes to our health. Much love, Melissa. Well, thanks, Melissa. Melissa is the name of my youngest daughter, so, uh, Great name, by the way. I love nothing more than empowering people with the knowledge that they need to take back control of their own health. So let's keep spreading the word and keep doing it because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you. See you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.